welcome to the second night of the Northeast Georgia Science Symposium. Woo! I'm just ignoring the microphone. So glad you guys are here again today. Yay! Yay! You gotta do it the first time to prove that you can do it, right? So we're proving we can do it. So here we are. So fire trucks. <laughs> Science has to be three things for it to be true. Observable. Say it loud. Observable. Yes. Repeatable. That's it. That's your one thing. Repeatable. Measurable. And measurable. You can measure it. Measurable. Objective. Objective. Measurable is also good. We will add a fourth one. Measurable. <laughs> yes. Yes. So that's how we discover, that's how we determine if something is true, if it's actually science, is if it's objective, observable, and repeatable, if you can measure it. Obviously, if you cannot see it, it is not measurable. If it only happens to one person, they also cannot measure it. If it only happens once, if it's a singularity, it is not measurable, right? So objective, observable, repeatable. So the Northeast Georgia Science Symposium is here to bring local science experts who are experts in their field to talk to us about what science they can show us in their field that is objective, observable, and repeatable. So in line with that, tonight we have Nick Carter of Carter Consulting, one of the premier OSHA compliance companies. He's presenting a hands-on, interactive, family-friendly discussion on the efficacy of masks for welders, nurses, and us. So how do they function in the environment? How do we function in the environment? What kind of PPE do we actually need? How does that work? Oh, and I covered all the rest of the stuff. You need me. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, here is Nick Carter of Carter Consulting. I hope everyone is doing really well and enjoyed getting to spend some time outdoors. Um, we're going to spend the next three hours no, I'm kidding, <laughs> um, discussing and talking about PPE. Let's see if I'm going to go the right direction here. Uh, this is going to catch up. Maybe I can. Uh... Sorry, you had an equipment malfunction. Oh, equipment malfunction. There we go. Okay. All right. We're back. So in my field, one of the things when I go in to work with a client, we need to determine uh, what type of PPE is required for their hazards. Well, one of the questions I often get is exactly what is PPE? What is PPE? Personal protective equipment. Exactly. That's what it stands for. Uh, up until really a couple of years ago when I discussed PPE with my clients, you, we really didn't use the acronym that often. And in my field, we all, all it is is acronyms. Um, we had to spell it out as in personal protective equipment. So what is personal? Right? It's us. Right? It's things that affect our being when we're in a certain type of environment. When we think of protection, right? what is intended and capable, right, of guarding and protecting against someone. And then equipment. So why is PPE required? I'm just going to use this. There we go. Why is PPE required? For protection. Right. Because we're going to be introduced to hazards. There are hazards that we constantly engage with. In fact, all of us came here prepared and equipped with different levels and types of PPE based upon the hazards that we were facing as soon as we got up this morning. Whether it was temperature, right? This is a form of level of personal protective equipment. 
right? I put my shoes on. Why? Because I'm walking on the asphalt, right? Now, there's, these shoes are designed for certain specific types. I wouldn't take these and go try to play soccer with them. That'd be foolish. They're not designed for that. So as we go through this, I want to get your mind geared towards design, right? What is the function and what is the hazard that we are encountering? Well, let's think about where did PPE get started, right? So often we think of in our, in our common world right today in the, either the medical industry or in the, um, uh, you know, different uh, like mining industries, maybe, metalworking industry. So we're going to take a look at a couple different industries. But really, at the beginning, we had people who went into battle. And they needed to be protected against the enemy, right? A sword, an arrow. And PPE got bigger and better. All the way, you'll see this guy right here going into battle with his cool suit of armor. We don't, we don't really see that too much these days, do we? It's very impractical, isn't it, right? So technology changes in regards to PPE. Right? Thankfully, I, I don't have to wear something like that into work to guard against machinery or equipment, right? It's not very agile. It's very heavy. You can't see very well. We've moved in from also to PPE, whether it's a military standpoint, whether it's civilian or whether it was sports, to end into the industrial age into a sense of where we see personal protective equipment being not only uh, used by those who kept getting hurt. Man, I'm sick and tired of picking up this hot object and it burning my hand. I need a device or something. Oh, I'll, I'll use a glove. You know, I have welding gloves here, right? I need a welding glove. encountering very much depends on the type of equipment that we need. I would not use this glove right here to go into a meat processing facility. A lot of my clients are in the food industry, even though it might protect me, but it's going to create other hazards, right? Other food hazards, maybe. So we have to think about what are we using? What are we putting on? What are the hazards that I'm trying to protect myself against? in the industry, but also to what's functional for the environment. So if I were going to protect my hands maybe from heat or chemical or prevent my hands from being pulled into a machine, I would wear maybe a glove like this. But if I were going to maybe wear a simple um, glove that wanted to protect my hands from chemicals would give me more dexterity, something along these lines, or keep my hands warm, or keep my hands from being cut or lacerated. So PPE has changed so much over the years and continues to change. There are companies like 3M, um, private companies like NIOSH, an American safety standard that work with these leaders in the industry. Top scientists, I recently uh, went and uh, listened to a speaker talk about ear protection. And it was amazing the technology and how it's come in regards to our ears. I didn't even realize this until I, uh, I went to this class was that our fingers are designed for perfect size to fit inside of our ears and really <laughs> provided they provide great PPE. <laughs> they actually do a fantastic job plugging your ear and preventing and reducing a noise or a loud decibel enough so that it doesn't damage your ears. The fire trucks turn on their sirens very loud put that inside of the building, it's even more loud. You want to put on an earmuff or something. But isn't it great that our fingers are designed to fit right in there and fit in our nose too if we need to take something out maybe? <laughs> what are we trying to protect ourselves from? I think is sometimes the question. What are we protecting ourselves from? There are physical dangers out there. Heat, metal, sharp objects. Things that can come at us from all different directions. Things that we might step on. Things that we're picking up. 
environmental dangers, sun exposure, heat exposure, cold exposure. A lot of the facilities I work in, a lot of my clients, most of them are refrigerated. I was training a class earlier today, and uh, even though we were not in the refrigerated area, just being outside of it, man, I had to put my jacket back on. Wait, can someone turn the heat up in here? But our environmental hazards and the dangers that come along um, with that affect us in multiple different ways. So how do we protect ourselves from that? Chemical hazards. If we're using chemicals, mixing chemicals, we can inhale chemicals. Chemicals can get on our hands. They can splash on our clothes. Cassie can tell you how many times I've ruined pairs of pants, right? Going on to the job site and I didn't even realize I got something and now I have, you know, tie-dye <laughs> pants. Should have worn my PPE that day. <laughs> Or, 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 or a bad pair of pants. So we can expo be exposed so many different uh, chemicals in so many different ways, so we need to know how we're interacting with these hazards and what our exposure is. Biological hazards, that's a hard one. Talk about things you can't see. So we need to know our environment. If I'm gonna be cooking, <clears throat> in a kitchen, PPE can go as far as, as when I'm working with a glove to not have cross-contamination, to have washable, cleanable surfaces. If I'm working in a laboratory where, uh, thankfully I don't have to do this, right, where they are handling uh, viruses, right, or different pathogens, Biological hazards can be found in spit, saliva, and blood when we do bloodborne pathogen training. You know, the fire team out there, they're all EMT trained. They have to know how to handle and deal with human blood and bodily fluid in a manner in which they're protected. You can't use a cotton glove to dress someone's wound. It's gonna absorb right in. Right. So what type of hazards are we engaging with? Thermal dangers, hot and cold both. You know, our bodies are designed to really operate within a certain range. You get too cold, the immune system's affected, you start to get sick. You get too hot, your organs and your brain start to get a little freaked out. You have seizures, right? We have certain internal things that have hot help, right? You get all sweaty and your AC system starts working. So the thermal dangers, electrical hazards. Just recently had to buy a new pair of boots. I didn't even realize and I forgot, oh, most of the thousand types of boots that I wear have electrical rating. That means they don't have any metal parts on them. You wouldn't want to wear something if you're about to engage with a power panel or uh, go and um, pull a, a generator or pull a 440 line and, and now I have an arc flash issue, right? I make sure I take my belt buckle off or something along those lines. I don't want to have any metallic items when I'm going into that. So we have checklists as well that we go through as we're determining. So what's needed to be protected? What areas are we trying to protect? Really all of us, right? I, all of us from top to bottom. But I go into an environment I'm not going to put on a full entire suit. We recently uh, painted the basement, and I did. I, I put on a full, you know, slipped in with little booties, uh, covered my whole entire face, mask. Cassie got a picture of me, so this is how we're preparing for COVID. <laughs> but, um, but no, we, what was I doing? Well, one, I didn't want to get any paint on me, right? Oh, that was the big thing. I have to clean it and wash it off. You know, my, my skin is very porous. So I want to make sure that's protected against any chemicals that I might encounter. So your head, your face, ears and eyes. What could potentially get into these areas? Right? From uh, hearing damage. We don't want our bodies to become damaged. So, so what do we do? Well, we need to have proper rated hearing and eye, ear, ear protection, eyes, all the way from different uh, objects that we might see, 
So we have tinted glasses here, right? If you're working outdoors, but these are strictly impact rated, right? They're not gonna protect me for anything other than that. And when we go to choose what type of PPE we're gonna use in different types of environment, we look at rating. Each and every device and the type of PPE that it has has a rating to it. That gives us an understanding of, from a scientific standpoint, what they did and how they tested it. So they took this eye protection here and they set it in a uh, nice fancy machine and then they repeatedly hit it over and over and over again with different size projectiles and different forces until it broke. And then they know, oh, pieces that are this size and coming at this speed will break this. So we need to back up one step and these are now rated for <laughs> these size particles at these type of speeds. And I can then fit the function to the person who is engaging with that type of hazard, whether they're grinding, whether they're working on a saw. I use these when I uh, work around the house doing yard work, right? Makes sense, they're rated for that. But if I were working in an extremely dusty area with finer particles, and I wanted to prevent those fine particles from coming into my eyes, I might wear something more along the lines of a goggle, right? Or a face shield. Now, not this one in particular. This one's rated for brazing, right? Not so much for welding. But once again, what's the hazard? Light, bright light. Well, Nick, but this one's, this one's shaded. Why wouldn't this one? Can I take this one and look at the sun? Absolutely not. I probably wouldn't even look at the sun with this one either. But with my welding mask, we could. That's what it's rated for. Right? So we need to know and understand when we're choosing PPE to go into an environment, what type of equipment um, do we need? What type, what type of hazards are we at risk of encountering? From respirators to lungs, something over your, your mouth, something over your nose. I recently, when we did some construction at the house, I was at Ace. I saw these things, I thought they were pretty cool. They're absolutely worthless, don't buy them. They're like earplugs for your nose. <laughs> but you can breathe, apparently, right? They're like these soft little sponge things, and then they said they were supposed to work. The guy looked pretty cool. I'm like, oh, that's convenient, I'll try them out. No, absolutely not. No dice. Our hands, we encounter so often, we're working with our hands as humans unless we have a machine doing the work for us. So our hands need to stay protected. The type of clothing we wear and footwear also too. Let's think about the different types of industries, right? And as we go through the different types of industries, we have to think about the hazard, the hazards that exist, and what areas need to be protected, right? So in the construction industry, what type of hazards exist? A lot of hazards, depending on what type of work you're doing, right? Could be sanding a drywall, need a, need a, would need a respirator. You're sanding drywall, right? Hearing protection, can't tell you how many times I go out uh, and work with a contractor and, what, huh? I feel as though I'm, I'm getting there myself now, also too, in our older age, because our, our bodies fall apart and deteriorate. <clears throat> Hard hats, what type of items we could potentially see falling? So we need to be protecting our, our heads. As we go through this too, there are different types of, like this right here. Man, it looks like a fire hat, but just because it looks like a fire hat, none of us in our right mind would take this and go and try to fight fire. Um, fire hats, if you've ever had an opportunity to hold one in your hand, are extremely heavy, right? They're not very comfortable. They have chin straps. They, they do more than just protect us from falling objects. They protect us from heat, right, as well. The new fancy ones, too, have earpieces in them so you can talk and communicate with your crew. Some even fanciers have lights, maybe, on the front so that we can see where we're going. But it looks like it. And I think that's sometimes the misnomer when we choose PPE. And I run into it with my clients, for instance, 
Well, it's a glove. Can it protect them from, why would I, why would I want to spend 30 cents more on this type of glove versus that type of glove? Well, this one's rated for chemicals. If I start handling um, petroleum with a glove that's not rated for petroleum or chemical-based items, what do we run into? Well, we run into now a situation where we potentially have petroleum going through the glove. The glove could melt and disintegrate. We've had situations like that happen on job sites before where uh, our team goes out and we spec out a glove or we spec out eye protection for them and the customer pinches that bottom line. I don't know. I don't know if that's really the right option. We could, and then our employees keep losing them. Or, uh, you know, we, we just, we can't get the right, like, the, the right fit. They get cost so much. And it does. PPE is expensive. Well, what costs more, right? Our, us and our bodies, right? So that's what we're looking to protect. So making sure what we have in our environment is in fact what we have designed and is rated. So smelting, right? Metal work, another very hazardous industry. What does he need to be protecting against? Think about this guy, Close. right? He's dealing with temperatures, thousands of degrees. He needs to reflect that heat constantly. Most of these folks also too are wearing some type of scuba gear, right? Some type of external breathing apparatus, depending on the type of ironwork and metalwork that they're doing, would depend upon the oxygen that's in the area, as well as the toxicity of the air. Speaking of some of the environments like this too, as a safety professional, the first thing we really try to do is engineer out the hazard. That's the first thing we want to do. Really the last line of defense is PPE. You know, the first thing we do is we say, oh, well, this is our hazard. Well, how can we not interact with this hazard? The second thing we try to do is, is put a process in place so that we don't interact with the hazard. But if we have to, like this guy, clearly has to interact with the hazard, right? We need to make sure they're protected against it. So what's the hazard associated here? Heat, light, gas. medical industry. What are the hazards associated in the medical industry? Blood. Blood. It's a big one. Diseases. Absolutely. Yeah. Viruses. Yes. Angry people are a hazard. Yeah, not, not getting what you want, when you want it, how you want it. What was that? Skin. Yeah, absolutely. So how do we protect ourselves? And they're getting donned up there. They got their masks, they got their hoods, they got their visors. <clears throat> not only in the medical industry does the PPE that we recommend protect the individuals wearing it, but keep in mind, it also protects the individual they're maybe having to work on as well. And very often in the medical industry, we're dealing with open wounds. I mean, think about our skin. What is our skin doing? It's protecting our insides, right? The only way things can get in to us is through our nose and our mouth is why we keep telling our kids, get your hands out of your mouth. Quit picking your nose and your boogers, right? But no, these are, all, these are all the things, you know, when we're training people to uh, prevent things like passing on or getting sick, we wash your hands, constantly touching things, or quit touching your face and your eyes, spreads germs. So what do we do? Well, in the medical industry, we put things in place that prevent the operator from touching their face, right? Or if they touch their face, there's now a step in a process of changing equipment, changing gear. Also, these are washable surfaces. You'll notice a surgeon never goes into surgery wearing leather gloves <laughs> or cotton gloves. No, they wear a glove that's designed specifically, right, to be washable. 
to not tear. Latex is the thing sort of almost of the past. You can still find a latex glove here and there, but nitrile has really come a long, long way as far as technology goes. Some of the PPE we, we, we see constantly require our masks. And what does a mask do? Right. Masks have multiple different functions. I have a couple of masks here. Right. We have a, a general standard um, face covering. You can even call this a, a mask. It is a mask, right? That will do what? What is this designed for? Because we need to think about that when we are trying to protect ourselves against certain things, right? So I would not wear this mask when I would uh, be mixing chemicals. This, this is not going to prevent me from being exposed. My lungs, right, from encountering any chemicals. I wouldn't wear this. I, I wouldn't wear this mask as a, as a dust mask. This is simply to prevent me from spitting on you while I talk, right? Or if you're going to be talking to me, any of your spit or your saliva getting on me, really, at the end of the day. But just like any of the other PPE that we have, we have to wear it right. I, I could wear it like this, I could wear it like this. I see a lot of people wearing them like this nowadays in the grocery store, right? I got it here. Just not fit in. Right. Um, but no, I, I would need to, it's designed, right, for with two earpieces, that way it fits snugly up against your face. It's expandable as well, so it can cover more of our face. It has a little nose wire, so it can get a snug fit. I would want this to be as, as snug as I possibly could to prevent as much of projectiles as I have or projectiles coming at me from getting into my nose or my mouth. This does not require a fit test. Well, what is a fit test? Does anyone know what a fit test is? What is a fit test? <laughs> it's a personal test to determine your personal fit for the PPE. Absolutely. Now, we fit test for multiple different types of things, and some fit tests are regulated. Like, for instance, every single one of those um, firefighters when they went through training, and when I was a volunteer firefighter in Albany many, many years ago, Albany, New York, not Albany, Georgia. It's Albany. Albany. It's Albany. Yes. <laughs> what did they do? They stuck a mask similar to this, maybe a little bit bigger, full face shield. I couldn't find my full face shield. I was, that's what Shiloh said. I was digging through the attic trying to find it. But they stick me in this box, and then they fill this box full of smoke. And if my mask starts to fill up with smoke, it clearly doesn't fit me. <laughs> I can't go into this fit test also, too, with a beard or a goatee or a mustache. You have to be clean, clean shaven. I, if you'll notice, most of those guys were clean shaven, right? And there's a reason. Because when they go into a fire, they want their mask to seal to their face. Because that's the hazard. Man, I can't tell you the absolute awful hazards that are present when you are going into a house, all the way from not only the heat, you can't see, your visibility, everything that's burning off from polyesters to couches to um, ceiling to everything that when it catches on fire and the chemicals that it releases, oh, it's nasty, nasty stuff. Not only does it in the smoke, you want to be protected. This right here is a simple um, P99 mask, right? It's about one of the, uh, the highest ratings you can get if you just go to a Home Depot, right? Once again, in your home use, not a, not no fit test required, but if I were gonna put this in an industrial setting, we would need a fit test and it would need to be required. Once again, because of the hazards, we're expecting this to eliminate from fine dust particles, right? Up to uh, different chemicals and any smoke. We um, were talking earlier about uh, what were you saying, Jason, about you're standing in the line at, uh, or at uh, oh, yeah, Popeye's? The grocery store, yeah. The grocery store. Man, doesn't that chicken smell good? Well, if you can smell 
fried chicken through your mask. It's not effective. And I was bringing up the fact that when um, Cassie and I uh, make soap or make product or, or mixing things, this is a mask also too that we would use in a situation like that because of what it filters out and how when I put this on, I cannot smell anything except my bad breath, right? So, that, that, so we need to figure out what we're choosing, why we're choosing, but also too that it fits us. That when we put on a mask or when we put on eyewear, I'm not going to take this eyewear and put it on someone. We're all built differently. So we need to have options available, right? Not only to our employees, to our staff, uh, and to our family members that things that they can wear that should be comfortable. Right? That's a big part of PPE because there's no point in having PPE if people aren't going to wear it. So it needs to be comfortable, it needs to be affordable, it needs to be available, and it needs to be rated correctly. We talked about the firefighter just now. What do they have? They have the helmet, they have the hood, the face mask, the external oxygen gear, gloves, and boots. And each one of these has a certain specific function. Right? Their boots have steel shanks running front to back. They're water resistant. They're heat resistant. They're about 35 pounds each. So you need a, you need a lot of leg, a lot of leg muscle to get back, back and forth. Their suit in and of itself is too rated. Fire rated, terror resistant <coughs> rated. It's going to protect you from the heat, but as well it's going to keep from catching on fire. It's a good thing. We wouldn't want anyone catching on fire as, uh, as they came into the building. Another hazardous industry that we see when we work with is the fisherman industry. I go into some facilities and um, they are completely wet facilities, 24-7, 365, there's water running. There's water running on the floor, there's water spraying everywhere. Most of these facilities are refrigerated too. And the last thing you need is someone wet and someone cold. That is a recipe for disaster. One, your employees aren't very productive when they're wet and they're cold. So you want to keep them dry and keep them warm. So what do we have here? Well, in the fishing industry, not in the industrial side, of it, but if you're on a boat, you need a life jacket. Yeah, I'm not going to put anyone on a boat or put anyone at risk of falling overboard without some type of flotation device. And we want to keep them dry. There's nothing that will suck the energy out of a human being faster than being wet and being cold. So we want to keep them dry. We want to put reflective gear on them so that we can see each other right? as well. So think about those things as you pick your PPE. What do you need? The logging industry. <coughs> Another extremely hazardous industry. We're doing some yard, um, so I guess yard work slash logging work for uh, some of our uh, friends at church. And I tell you what, I was looking at all this gear, thinking, man, I need to get some more. I need to get some more. <laughs> it's pretty sweet. I'm not sure I'm fully protected, right? <laughs> but the things that you encounter, you know, are running my chainsaw. Well, yeah, I need ear protection. But um, I have chips flying out of me from cutting from overhead, right? The crew that's uh, working down underneath as we're dropping limbs out of the trees, how, what kind of protection do they need? Is a cotton glove going to be standard or should they have something more substantial? Making sure all my guys have steel toe boots on or some type of protective toe right, to protect their foot. If it's sunny outside, we don't need to be squinting the whole time. Right? So having some type of shades. We had a friend just recently. I've never been a big fan of chaps, right? Until recently, he, uh, he was working with a saw, and he moved his hand over here. And I, we don't know exactly how, but the saw was still running. He didn't set his brake, and it came around and just nicked the side of his leg. And he had chaps on, and it did exactly what they were supposed to do. Nice thick pad. It tore it away. It stopped the blade immediately. If he had had just a regular pair of jeans or car hearts on, we'd have been having a trip to the hospital that day. 
Can't tell you enough horror stories when it comes to the folks not wearing their PPE and folks getting hurt. Because we engage with these hazards. We sometimes engage with these hazards at home and then we go into an industrial setting and we don't realize maybe the ramifications or how quickly things can hurt us. Go into and thinking about oil drilling and rigging. What type of hazards exist there? Explosion hazards, dust, chemical hazards as well. A lot of, uh, lot of hard hats required, a lot of uh, rigging taking place. All right. So gloves, gloves rated specifically too for handling and dealing with oil. So that way it doesn't penetrate our hands, but as well gives us grip on the things we're trying to grab. Oil is very slickery, right? <coughs> It is a carabiner, yes. If you, in, in, the, in the oil industry, um, a lot of the times folks are working on platforms or rigs um, that have a drop off to either one side or the other. So they need to be harnessed in constantly, um, working uh, in any area over four feet. You need to be, uh, well, in, in the construction industry and uh, six feet in the uh, in general industry. Right. So ensuring that our crew and our team and our clients have the right equipment uh, that they come prepared with for the job. At the end of the day, right, PPE has one specific purpose. And that is, is when we have to engage with a hazard, right, whether that hazard we can see, whether that hazard we're going to touch, or we can smell, right? What do we need to be prepared? What areas are we trying to protect? Is it rated correctly for the type of environment? And there are so many, di there's so much different information. Very often when you purchase something, right? Like when I purchase this mask right here, there is a laundry list of items that it will tell you that it will protect you from and things that it will not protect you from and how to wear it correctly. I encourage everyone whenever you're purchasing any PPE that you take some time to research the hazard specifically what you're trying to protect yourself from. Get a good understanding of what the hazard is because until we understand the hazard we don't understand and we don't know what to equip the person with and these things do take time. Sometimes it's uh, not so much trial and error, <laughs> right? We, we, we don't like it to be trial and error, um, but maybe for fitting or finding the right tool or the right cost or, you know, um, for instance, if I were to put on this mask and to go into a, an environment, well, maybe there's a hood that's also required or maybe I had to put my head into a certain spot or area where I might not be able to get my mask. So maybe I need a center. Um, mask with a center filter so just the more trial and error is dependent upon what works best cost wise uh, and environmental wise but before we ever issue any type of PPE we do determine the, the steps that I've been listed right know your hazard know what it's rated for all PPE will give a rating they will tell you specifically what it can and cannot do if you're buying PPE off the back of Joe Schmo's truck, probably not the best PPE, right? Um, PPE is also designed, you have your industrial, right? Personal protective equipment and as well the stuff you can go and buy it at Home Depot, right? And not the stuff you buy at Home Depot isn't, isn't bad, um, but very often the training doesn't come along with it as far as how to wear it, um, what you should expect out of it. A good fit test for something like this would be once you put it on, you're going to breathe in and you can blow out and you can cover up your exhale. And if, if you're getting air blowing out in the air, it's probably not fitting correctly. Tighten it up. If you're experiencing when you're working with, uh, for instance, projectiles and you put this on, you still find that you're getting dust. Well, maybe you need a larger goggle or maybe a face shield as well. Any questions? 
all personal protective equipment that we have? Yes. Do medical masks, so would this mask work against smoke? No, it does not work against smoke. So the only thing that would work against smoke would be something that would be sealed against your face. Air and water find the easiest ways to travel and the path of least resistance. So if I have this mask on my face, all of the air that I breathe in and out is going out the side. Nothing is going through this mask, air-wise. Nothing. I mean, I can put it here and, and push hard. Grab one of these next time you're at Sprouts or wherever. They have them free everywhere nowadays. Uh, in fact, I grabbed a handful of them on my way out the door just so I would make sure that I was from one of my clients. But um, put it up to your mouth and breathe. You can't. It's, it's hard to breathe out. Is it, it's hard to breathe in. It's harder to breathe in than it is with this mask. This is specifically only designed to prevent, like I said, my sneeze, my cough, if uh, my saliva gets overexcited. I'm working with a uh, doctor and I was talking to him the other day and I was sitting and he was standing I was telling Cassie, I was like, it was like little droplet after little droplet right on my face. I was like, well, if I, uh, I don't know about this. Maybe I should hand him one of these next time I go and see him. But hey, here you go. Yeah, this is for you, not me. Maybe, maybe, maybe. But, um, but no, that, that's what this is designed for. And, and in the medical industry, they, they use these because, one, when you're standing over someone or if someone coughs on you, you don't want that right in your face. That's gross. Yeah. A lot, we use uh, face shields as well very often, right, to protect from that. Uh, some of my clients are more uh, mask. In fact, while we were standing outside, I just got an email update. You know, they're changing their mask policy. But um, prior to changing their mask policy, and I do a lot of training for them and onboarding, it's hard for me to stand in front of people and, and train and teach for five hours with one of these on my face. And I used to have a goatee or mustache and it itches and I'm still like touching it. And now that I've touched it, now this is dirty and it's contaminated, nah, it doesn't work. No, I would have to throw this away. These are very much designed uh, specifically for the medical industry. We're using them now a lot to prevent um, things like what I see like sneezing, but that's really all they're protecting you from. This, this will not protect you uh, from dust or any any particles that that we can see or not see right this on the other hand uh, would would protect you uh, I, I have a picture somewhere in my phone not too long after places started opening up um, people in Home Depot literally wearing these walking around I'm like well at least that's effective they look <laughs> silly but at least that's way more effective than anything else so any other questions? Yes. So you, you showed, you know, and you said part of the problem is non-compliance. Yes. So, and, and I think I remember a statistic from like the deadliest test that uh, somebody dies every day <clears throat> during right. the major fishing season. I, I'm assuming that's for a, not just the environment itself, but a lack of compliance with that. Right. So what we find and what we see is is compliance really starts with the industry in and of itself. Um, some of my clients that I work with and we talk to them about compliance and unfortunately it's a reality but companies very often do look at their bottom line I mean they you have to look at your bottom line right or else you're not successful as a company and so they think to themselves well we're insured for this and they rest on on their insurance uh, I try to convince them that well we are human beings and that life is more important than your insurance and your bottom line and try to promote that and push that but when it's not only whether it's with PPE, but a lot it's with process and process and folks following the certain processes that are in place. Um, and, and when we see the non-compliance is when we see folks begin to get hurt. And just the same way, how many of you follow the speed limit getting here today? Oh, fantastic, great job. These individuals, no guarantee, will not get speeding tickets. For the rest of us, though, it's an option, right? It's a possibility. I was lying. Okay. 
Well, you know, yeah. we, we see in roofing all the time that the guys are required to tether onto the roof. Right. And, and it's fall prevention. Correct. But it's hard to maneuver the roof. Yes. You know, you've got to you've got to constantly adjust your rope. You've got to reset your harness and things like that. And so yeah. we find a lot of times when nobody's looking, you just take it off. Correct. Until the first guy falls and dies. And then surprisingly, everybody is willing to comply. And then I'm not saying we need off somebody, but it, it, I mean, it is a challenging industry. And there are a lot of challenging industries because people see it as a nuisance, not as a prevention right. issue. Yeah. And really so when it comes, time. you're right, when it comes to uh, my field and what <laughs> we try to work with with our clients to do, I tell them, guys, I'm not coming here um, to, you know, make you more efficient, uh, more effective, and save you gobs of money. The, the, those things will come. They will. And companies out there who have um, fantastic uh, hardcore safety programs are often the more hazardous types of industries. Uh, OSHA is getting continually more and more involved in, uh, in certain specific types of industries where they have certain specific codes um, written directly to, for instance, in the meat industry. Uh, they are continuing to change what they expect. Um, they are continuing to change their oversight as well. You know, the USDA and the FDA now carry the power that OSHA carries. If they go in and they see a hazard, it could be non-food related at all, they have the same weight and they are looking at the same programs and they're determining. So the government does see the um, the need for more compliance but at the end of the day like with uh, speeding how many of us got tickets did anyone get a ticket see that's the problem none of us got tickets so why would we want to change our behavior and it isn't until someone gets hurt or someone gets sick or someone gets burned that it sort of opens up our eyes to we need to change this is real, right? I'll piddle around town and I won't put my seatbelt on, but man, as soon as I get on the interstate and that first semi truck passes by me, I'm like, whoo, what's going on there? I hate to get hit by that sucker, right? Do you find most people engage your services before or after an incident? The smart ones before, yes, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I would say uh, most of my current clients that I have are more apt to reach out to me after they've had an incident. Oh, this just happened. What do we need to do to fix it? Instead of seeing, and what we try to do is, is teach them methods for uh, looking at small, what we call near misses, or um, risks associated with uh, certain specific hazards, and doing internal auditing processes where they can uh, look at whether it's a tool, whether it's a process, whether it's a person, whether it's a job function, and determine uh, based upon what they've seen, whether it's they're continuing to uh, experience risk and therefore need to put something in place to change that, or whether they need different PPE, or whether they need to engineer or design their environment differently. So it, it depends um, really too on their time, but very often it's, once someone's gotten hurt, uh, ooh, well, we gotta fix this. We can't keep this going on. Yes, sir. Jeff, what you need to advertise is PPE. PPE. As ridiculous as the first one is. <laughs> right? Absolutely. You know, that's funny because I think to myself and I tell folks a lot of the time, you know, the past predicts the future. And what does that mean? That means if, if, we, if we keep behaving this way, we're gonna have to keep having the same result and the same result and the same result. And it's not until we change and make a change that we'll see our results change uh, going forward. So yeah, it's, uh, it's challenging out there, um, but thankfully there are some amazing companies out there designing amazing equipment um, like I said, the, the, the industry continues to change. I mean, I, um, we used to wear these constantly, and I got to tell you, after five or six hours of wearing this, I had to start hurting the back of my ears, I start getting a headache, and materials have gotten lighter, um, they have gotten softer, and at a better cost, too, which is nice. You know, you used to be able to get 
really, really good stuff, but it cost you an arm and a leg. And then your employee loses it. Now you got to replace it again. And now an employee loses it again. Did you have a question? Yeah. Hitting the thought as an individual is not going to happen to me and it's costly, so I'm going to wait till something does occur before I do anything to protect myself. <laughs> it really is. Um, one of the things that we try to do is, is to delve into the psychology of the employee, right, and to the demographic as well. Depending on, I have clients in uh, Texas and in Michigan uh, and in Baltimore and here in Atlanta and in Puerto Rico, and not, well, they are, are in Florida, I haven't, yeah, I just contact them over the phone mainly, uh, but in um, Fort Lauderdale and Miami and Naples and all these different demographics and you see the level at which people care for themselves because of how they were raised. Right. And so depending on how they were raised and their experiences growing up really depends on what they think or what they believe of one, what they're being told to do or not to do. Right. You can't tell me what to do. Who are you? We'll, we'll see. Um, or two, the, oh, yeah, absolutely. Just because you told me to do it, absolutely I'll do it. Um, all the way to, to the belief or the trust in that this is really going to help me. Eh, we'll see. I don't know. Like, you don't know how many times, like I can squint my eyes, or I can close my eyes really fast before <laughs> things get to me. Uh, I've heard it all. The, the reasons why people do or don't wear certain types of equipment. So do, so do companies usually contact you then, and you go out to see them? Correct, yeah. So, um, so I would be contacted and uh, then either come out, we first start with an audit, um, to determine what specific hazards they need or if they're having a certain specific types of injuries or if they have a new process or if they're getting a new piece of equipment. And then we work with them to um, put in engineering uh, safeguards uh, to ensure that they have the right processes in place. And then if in last resort, as I said, if they need something that makes sure that they have everything that's rated correctly, we try to find and source um, good material for them at the right price point, and then we train their employees um, around that process. Are you associated with OSHA at all? So only in regards to I deal with them. I, I don't, I, I am also, if they have an OSHA problem, like I had a client in uh, Kentucky uh, year, last year who they were using dry ice in a process. Um, and as we know, dry ice isn't toxic, but it does displace air. And so we had, they had staff who were getting lightheaded. And so we had to figure out, okay, well, what do we do? Well, we're not going to put scuba gear on everyone. We need to engineer, we need to get for some fresh air, pull some fresh air in. Maybe we need to rotate people through the room. Maybe we need to use less dry ice. I don't know. So there are a lot of aspects there. So I will deal with OSHA as a liaison to uh, make sure that, because uh, very often a lot of my clients are smaller companies that don't have the resources or the means to have a full-time person on staff that can uh, manage either a claim or manage um, just the process with what OSHA requires and how to communicate and talk. So I don't work for OSHA, but work with them and really a lot of the governing bodies. So EPA, um, local, state, and federal uh, entities as well when it comes to either occupational safety and health. We do uh, risk management plans for folks. We handle claims as well. Um, and really t any type of government compliance when it has to do with human health and safety. So, so when COVID came out and everyone started wearing masks, are you contacted constantly about the topic about masks? Yes. Um, so I helped most of my companies build and put in protocols in place that would allow them um, the freedom to continue to operate uh, in a manner that fit their business model. And so there, were, um, there was a lot of information that was being presented in regards to the, ha the specific hazards. And a lot of us in the industry sort of laughed at it because they started changing what we knew in regards to, for instance, a fit test. I mean, the only way to eliminate a pathogen is to have an external air supply providing you with clean air or to filter out the current air around you. And the only way and capable of doing that is with a mask like this. So I came in and I said, well, if we're really that concerned, we need to put people in masks like this. What other things can we do? 
Well, we realized, you know what? We really don't encourage people to wash their hands that often. Let's give them more opportunities to do that. Let's, let's educate our employees about things that they can do. We talk about processes. Stay home if you're sick. That was a big one. If you're not feeling well, stay home. Engineering things, right? We had a lot of clients who put in um, heat or a thermostat. Uh, you know, you can come in and check, check, okay, I'm hot, I'm cold. You can check whether you have a mask on or you don't have a mask on or uh, and those type of things. So different types of electronic devices. So we were able to engineer. We were able to um, come in regularly also too and just clean environments better, right? Uh, where we may have been using um, different aerosols in the past uh, to to clean certain environments. So making sure that we those processes were in place correctly. So uh, we really tried to encourage uh, our clients to not just go directly for the mask. What other things can we potentially do in our environment to safeguard our folks from getting sick, right? And sick from anything. I mean, it's really at, at the end of the day. And a lot of that came through wipeable, washable, cleanable surfaces, right? We had to look at each one of our surfaces and make sure that we have certain folks only touching certain things. And when they do touch certain things, that they've done so in a certain manner. And so there were a lot of processes we changed. And then lastly, we looked at masks. And two, setting the expectation, right? Just like I would not put on this and expect it to protect me from dust or from the sun, but it's, it's glasses or even like these, these are not designed with the same material that these are. If you, are, in fact, they're extremely scratched up because I have used them to wear in the yard uh, and they do get rock flung at them. And so, but you know, it's one of those type of things that when we're working with our clients that uh, we ensure that they know and they have all the information possible. And then really it's up to them to make the decision. We don't, thankfully I'm in a position now where I don't have to make decisions. Uh, for folks, all I have to do is present the information to them and allow them to to, to do that on their own. I, and lest anyone think that it's expensive to use your services, uh, I was working with a roofing company in Florida. Uh, the first violation when we were flagged by OSHA was fifty-six thousand yeah. dollars. The second was one hundred and twenty-four. Right. And if we were caught with a third violation, it's two hundred and fifty-six thousand dollars. Yeah. And that. That's just a fine that you pay. It's mm -hmm. not that it does something. That's just you give money to the government that you right. don't return. Yeah. I, I, we calculated how many roofs we would have to sell with an extra profit just to pay back that $256,000. And surprisingly, it was affordable to have somebody come in and consult us about saving <laughs> yes. for weeks at a time. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and that's really sort of one of, you know, I was talking to a client the other day and they wanted to put a new process in place and they're having issues with some damage. I said, look, what we need to do is we need to determine the the cost here of the actual damage and what we're insured against and what we're not insured against versus having someone that's going to watch out for this damage 24 seven. Give me that number or look at that number. And so, yeah, you, you do need to, in the construction industry, fines can get up very, very quickly. I was reading an article the other day of a um, construction company in New Jersey and construction companies often do this. They will just all of a sudden become a new construction company. <laughs> oh, I'm just, a, I'm just a new company, new, new entity now. Yeah, I don't know where that other company went. I don't know. Um, but upwards of $2 million in fines. And fines, yes, are one thing. They are sort of the slap on, on the wrist, but really what OSHA wants and what I want to see, at least it's been my experience, once again, for the most part, is, is that they want to see employees and people protected, right? And don't we all? I mean, we're very, 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 very precious, right? Um, and there's only one Nick Mayne, right? And there's only one Cassie and Tyler, right? And uh, Nick only made, you know, I only have 10 fingers. So I need to protect all 10 fingers and two eyes. And so, um, when we go into our clients, that's one of the things we really try to talk about is the things we can't replace, the things we can't repair, um, things like asbestos or lead poisoning. These things that once they're in you, that's, that's it. You got it. The same thing with bloodborne pathogens, right? I try to encourage folks, you know, we go into working with our clients and put a bloodborne pathogen policy in, uh, in place. And they say, well, uh, yeah, I'm not really sure that we need uh, this first aid kit or that. I'm like, well, if you don't have them and someone is exposed, this it's a game changer. 
It's not like I'm just taking a pill and now I don't have HIV anymore. If we don't follow the rules and the regulations and the processes exactly the way they're spell, spelled out and allow someone to bleed on something and then just wipe it up with our bare hands, oh man, they have an exposure there. So we need to, yes, work towards that. And uh, with our clients, there is sort of an, an eye opener there um, very much to, to get them uh, on board. But in uh, today, and depending on the industry too, some are more apt. I remember um, I was working for a uh, uh, Cisco Foods, if you're familiar with Cisco Foods, uh, up in Connecticut. And I was responsible for over 600 employees we had at our facility there. And I'm the only safety person, safety professional. And my roommate worked for a laser extrusion company. They built lasers and they took glass rods and they heated them up and chemical and they pulled them out and they had about 70 employees of this small little laser building company 70 employees you know how many safety professionals they had directly related 14 <laughs> 14 safety professionals that their only job was to make sure and ensure that processes were done correctly so in the industry and it really depends you know you go into the pharmaceutical industry a lot of safety folks right Man, if something happens that goes wrong, that could go wrong very quickly. We look at some of these other industries as well, right? Some of the under industries don't have the profit margin. You look at Cisco, why do they only have one safety guy? Well, yeah, they're shipping millions and millions of cases, but they're making a nickel per case, <laughs> right? We're in the pharmaceutical industry, yeah, you're shipping millions and millions, and they're making $20 per pill, right? So your margin's there. Unfortunately, when it comes to, and we have to expect that when we go in and we work with our clients, right? And we're really talking to them about their bottom line. So it's always helpful when a company keeps good record keeping, right? And we can show them the benefits of uh, not only our services, but putting these processes in place and how they will save the bottom line. You know, you have your direct costs and your direct dollars, but all your indirect costs. You know, you got a lot of folks out on work comp. Well, now you gotta, you know, they're paying your insurance premiums and they're probably gonna go up, but you're also, having to replace that worker. So, it is beneficial. You know, I've, uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed working in this field. I never expected to ever work in this field. Um, but uh, God put me here and here we are. Any other questions about anything? I do have all kinds of, feel free to come up and take a look at um, any of the different types of equipment we have. You wanna try things on, try to look through these. I can see you guys a little bit there. Um, and how they fit, and this one got a little warm, so next, yes? Did any schools contact you? So I didn't work with any schools, no, not, not specifically. Um, I did talk to some um, folks within some certain colleges um, unofficially, uh, and some folks uh, in regards to um, different, uh, like Cobb County, uh, some fire department folks, some EMT folks. Uh, as we went through, and not so much about PPE, but hand sanitizer was a big thing that we talked about. What works, what doesn't work, and how do we protect? Um, what processes should we put in place? Because that's where I really try to start with. Can we design something differently? Uh, can, can we have a different process so that we're not exposed to the hazard? Uh, and, and training folks around that. PPE is a last resort, right? If we have to engage with the hazard. So I always encourage folks, and to, looking at what we were trying to fix. The only thing I knew at any, for any reason that would fix anything is, is this. And because this has a good, nice, tight seal and it won't let any air in or out except through these filters, which are designed to filter out nearly everything. <laughs> so. So did you tell them you use GPA hand sanitizer? I did, I did, absolutely. <laughs> Yes, and some bought into it. Yeah. <laughs> We're still selling them, so it's fantastic. So they make those in the kids' sizes? These masks right here? I have seen them very small. I, I personally, my children don't have one. I don't see any reason. They're not exposed to any hazards where they would, they would need one like this. But uh, I, have, I have seen them. It, uh, is, it, it is interesting, you know, going back to, uh, like for instance, with a child, the type of PPE that they might wear. I mean, I can barely get an adult to wear something on it correctly. And very often, uh, it's almost worse because things get caught on stuff. I have something like this, and I mean, who knows how it would be on and where and you know, how our jaws are placed. I mean, I know when I've been working with something like that, I mean, it's uncomfortable. It's not something, our, our bodies weren't really 
um, designed and 3M did a great job trying to make this as best as possible, but they didn't make it specific to my face, <laughs> right? They mass produced these and uh, thankfully it's nice and flexible and rubbery, but um, I still, I'll get finished and the bri bridge of my nose will be all red and I might have a migraine depending on how hard I've had to cinch it up or uh, wear it. So it's, um, you know, PPE can be uncomfortable, but it's a whole lot better than the other consequences, right? So I'll try to work with them on that as well. Great job. Okay.